to begin with a word of prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these opportunities to join in study, to open your word, and to learn that which you would have us to understand for this time. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We thank you for those that have joined with us and for those that will view this meeting later via, this, via video. Help us now, guide us so that all that we do and all that we address may be according to your will. Help us to learn, help us to be willing to be guided. Be with those that are not with us today. Please bless them. Map and wrap your arms around them, Father, so that they may know that that which is being done is that according to your will. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to walk out of the screen for a second, but I'm not walking away. Now, subject of today's study is to finish in Joshua 17. Now, as we had done so in the past, we have gone over this portion of the book of Judges. Now, all of this is showing us the area and the territory that the tribe of Manasseh had been granted, but also the tribe was granted that that is to the west of the Jordan. So they are one of those tribes that have property on the east and on the west. They are right in the middle of the promised land almost like a torso. Now, as we went through this, we were looking at different names. We are being shown from Numbers 2630 that these are the sons of Gilead. And of course, Gilead is one of the children of Manasseh. Jezer, the family of the Jezerites, of Helek, the family of the Helekites. And as Theodore had pointed out for us before, this is the same spelling as Helek, which is the word that is used for one hour in Hebrew, the Hebrew measure of time. So Helek is... Uh... Three and a third seconds. Is it? So, uh, helicum is a plural of helic. Just one helic then would be three and a third seconds. And then, um, so that would be like uh, 1,080 helicum would be one hour. Okay. I stand corrected. Thank you. And that's, you know, this is what I appreciate so much about the studies. I'm here to learn just like you are. So let's, let's continue with this. Thank you so very much, Stephen. But Zelophad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, had no sons but daughters. And these are the names of his daughters, Mahala and Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Tizra. So we have a man that has five daughters and no sons. And they came near before Eleazar the priest and before Joshua the son of Nun and before the princes saying, the Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brethren. Therefore, according to the commandment of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brethren of, of their father. And there fell 10 portions to Manasseh beside the land of Gilead and Bashan which were on the other side of the Jordan. 
but because the daughters of Manasseh had an inheritance among his sons and the rest of Manasseh's sons had the land of Gilead. We went through this <coughs> because the daughters did not wish to see the portion of the land that was given to their tribe pass on to another tribe. They went to Moses first, and then, as this period is taking place in Joshua, we're being shown that they have come again a second time before the leadership to remind them. This is what we addressed with Moses. And when we look this up, when we last were in this chapter, we found that Moses went before God, and God said, that they're right. Joshua 17, 7. And the coast of Manasseh was from Asher to Michmethath that lieth before Shechem. And the border went along the right hand into the inhabitants of En Tapoa. Now Manasseh had the land of Tapoa. But Tepoah on the border of Manasseh belonged to the children of Ephraim. That would then place Tepoah <coughs> to the west side border. And the coast descended unto the river Canaan, southward of the river. These cities of Ephraim are among the cities of Manasseh. The coast of Manasseh also was on the north side of the river, and the outgoing of it was at the sea. Now, the alternate reading here was of the brook of reeds. And when I prepared this, obviously, I forgot to put in the area where the Brook of Reeds was to be. So give me just a moment. Okay, so what we have here is this should have read, and the coast descended unto the brook of reeds rather than the river canal. And I'll correct that in, in, the, in my later notes. Now, we are given several other verses to look up. Joshua 16, 8, the border went out from Tapua westward unto the river Cana or the brook of reeds, and the goings out thereof were at the sea. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Ephraim by their families. So instead of, in, in some ways, they're saying border, and in some ways, as they were addressing here, they're calling it the coast. And then Joshua 16, 9 followed it up. And the separate cities for the children of Ephraim were among the inheritance of the children of Manasseh. All the cities with their villages. So there were a number of cities that now belong with the tribe of Manasseh. Joshua 17.10, southward it was Ephraim's, and northward it was Manasseh's, and the sea is his border, and they met together in Asher on the north and in Issachar on the east. Now Joshua 17.11, and Manasseh had in Issachar and in Asher Beth Shean, and her towns, and Iblam, and her towns, and the inhabitants of Dor, 
and her towns and the inhabitants of Endor and her towns and the inhabitants of Tanakh and her towns and the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, even three countries. Here again, the number three. Whether we have seen this as three days, whether we have seen this as three weeks, three years, three is popping up all over the place. <clears throat> but does this also not address that the inhabitants of Megiddo are part of the inheritance of Manasseh? Many other churches make a big thing about Armageddon. And that is to be a battle as they see it to be fought in the Valley of Megiddo. <clears throat> now, what are we seeing here with the different names? Beth Sheon would mean the house of something. So as we look it up, we find in one, one that they would call this the house of security or the house of perpetuity. Is there security to be found in this earth? Is there security to be found within man? Not really. Exactly. Now we also have Iblam. So, If we are looking at this through Hitchcock's Dictionary of Bible Names, one of the meanings would be a people decreasing. When you have a people decreasing from an area or from a town, they're leaving. They're abandoning that security. They're abandoning that town. we will be finding that there will be those that are going to abandon some of their long held beliefs when they begin to hear a true message. Because this is never going to be a peace and safety message. To understand and completely accept the third angel's message, we're understanding that we have to make a choice. And it's not going to be an easy choice. It's going to be a choice that we're given that we can either accept the security that's offered of the earth, or we are accepting to accept the eternal security that's offered from heaven. Now, Door. <clears throat> Door is in the word itself could be generations. What does that mean then for indoor? <coughs> indoor could mean the fountain of habitation. 
or the fountain of generations. Our true fountain, living water, is Christ. We're given an example that there are many cities here within Manasseh that are pointing to the end times. And it's not just Megiddo. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of Manasseh, but the Canaanites would dwell in the land. What does it tell us about the children of Manasseh if they are not driving out the Canaanites? What is that saying? They have uh, ceased from seeking to be holy. Is that read it? I would agree. Does it also mean that they are, are trusting in their own efforts and not in God's? In the chat, the comment is made that they failed to do their work. As we go through the study on all of these tribes, there are going to be multiple times that we're going to find that the inhabitants of those cities, the Canaanites, were not driven out. And that's one of the admonitions that God gave through Moses, that these tribes are to be driven out. They are to be removed from the land. Was Caleb able to remove the Canaanites from the portion that was allotted to him? Yes. Was Caleb an example for all of the children of Israel as to how they were to proceed? Was. So here's Caleb. He is driving out the giants. He's attacking the hardest ones because by faith he's told they will not stand against you. And he took God at his word. Brothers and sisters, we're coming to a time. And we're coming to a time very clearly and very quickly where we are going to be confronted with some of the bright lights, some of the, the greatly religiously trained people within the corporate church and within the world. We are going to be coming up against those that have received their doctor of divinity. Now, to me, there's nothing more blasphemous. And there's nothing sadder than a person that has sought and received a decree and a degree that says, you are now a doctor of the divine. We are studying so that our Heavenly Father can show us what we are going to need as we come up against those giants. Did Caleb take any shortcuts as it came to standing up against those giants? As in what would be a shortcut? Okay. Here's my problem. Today, we have many 
that wish to have a shortcut <clears throat> in their understanding of what the Bible is saying to us. They want to rely upon the word of man, man's interpretation of what the Bible says. Are we to rely upon man's interpretation or are we to rely on what we do, what we discover from the Bible by following Miller's rules? The latter. I agree. <clears throat> but does that not require some effort on our part? Well, yes. we're told that we've got to dig like we're trying to mine gold or something. Doesn't that require some effort? Oh, yeah. It's not an easy thing to go find gold. It's not an easy <clears throat> profession. It's not something that just comes naturally. How many gold miners do you find that if someone else comes to them and says, well, I want the gold that you're finding, tell me the easy way to do it. How, how can I do this from the comfort of my own home? How can I do this with, my, with all the things I love around me? I want a mine gold miner going to tell you that you can do that. First of all, you have to probe first. Right. Uh, and after you probe um, and you find a, a spot that uh, has produced something for you, then you have to excavate. Yes. Which means you have to pull a lot of dirt out of the way to get to your uh, base metal that you're looking for which right. in this case is gold. There's a process to it. And yes. it's, it's, it's laborious. And it takes, it, it takes time to understand exactly what you've got to do. Right? Yes, it does. It, takes, it, it takes a very long time to get to the point to where you can identify uh, where deposits are through your experience from the past. So it takes effort. Absolutely. And if you're not willing to put in the effort, you're not going to find the gold. So, uh, Caleb. Go ahead, please. Caleb wouldn't be able to take the land if he had been taking shortcuts. Agreed. Very much agreed. Now, <clears throat> a couple of other things have, have come to mind. I don't, I, I don't know many of you directly and personally, but I'm the type of a person that I like to cook. I've been asked many times over the years, why do I like to cook? And I've, I've had plenty of friends to the house where I have cooked different meals. Now, I had a time at a church where many of us would make meals within the church for different church members. Sometimes, sometimes we would have meals for as many as 200 that would have to be prepared within an hour to an hour and a half. Prepared, served, done. I had one time that I had prepared items. And I had the pastor's wife walk up to me later. And she go, that dish that you made today was so good. I want your recipe. 
I want your recipe so that I can impress my family with your cooking. Now I looked at her and I just, I shook my head because you can share a recipe with some and they're able to pretty much recreate it. And then you've got others that if they're not used to cooking, if they're not used to really thinking about what you're doing, you can share it with them and they're not gonna get it at all. Now at that same church, <clears throat> we had a time where we would do potlucks for the different members. <clears throat> we had done potlucks that were simple. Baked potatoes with different toppings. We had potlucks that were a little bit more complex, such as doing different Occidental, Chinese, Thai, Vietnamese dishes. We had a time that, that several of us that were involved in this were sitting down and we were just openly discussing. We've done this, we've done this. What is, what is one type of potluck we have never done? Now, my family's history is primarily, on my mother's side, Eastern European. And I just shrugged my shoulders and I said, German. Now, the other members of the family at that time, we had one family of Clan Gunn, very Irish. They look and they go, yeah, most of the members of this church. They are German. They would understand this. But that same pastor's wife came up and she was hearing the conversation and she looks at all of us and she goes, I don't know how to cook a German. And that was her comment. You can learn to cook, but it takes effort. You can learn to use the best ingredients that are available to you, but you need to assess those ingredients. There are no shortcuts in cooking properly. You cannot <clears throat> just pick up a pan, pick up a spoon, and make something if you don't know what you're doing. Caleb, when he went into the portion that was to be his, he went in faith. He went to drive out the giants. He didn't want any more of <clears throat> the reminders of 40 years of failure to be around him. He'd had enough. He wanted to go home. My question to you today, brothers and sisters, is very simple. Haven't you had enough? Don't you want to go home? Or are you satisfied with what you've got here? Not satisfied. I'm not satisfied at all. The question is, I'm going to place the effort so that it is, it is seen by those in the heavenly courts that the bride has made herself ready, that the bride is ready for the wedding feast, 
that we want to go home. In 1888, this didn't happen. Because the church was satisfied in their effort. We're doing all this for Christ. He'll see that we're doing all of this for him. And that was their prevalent attitude. Here we are today. Are we doing all for Christ? Or are we willing to let Christ, through his spirit, have all? Have we truly surrendered all to him? Is that our prayer in our song? Or are we saying, I'm doing it all for you? Consider that, because this is what I'm seeing as I look through these examples in the book of Joshua. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of these cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in the land. Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxen strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but they did not utterly drive them out. The Millerites and the Millerite movement was a strong movement. Yet by 1863, 19 years after the Great Disappointment, the church had chosen to accept that Leviticus 25 and 26 did not mean what Father Miller had presented. And this continued and has continued in the church to this very day. By 1980, we had Glacier View. I was out of the church at that time. Place review. I read the history that many within the church were in agreement with Desmond Ford. Yet they did not wish to upset the rank and file, the common people, and take away their understanding of the 2300 days. <clears throat> The chart that was presented on the WhatsApp yesterday was absolutely beautiful because it gave a simple, logical <clears throat> presentation of why the 2300 days as presented is valid. The children of Manasseh did not drive out the Canaanites. Now, from the chat, we'll read the following. Matthew 7.21 Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, that shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Did you notice the double doubling? Yes. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> uh, I can't use that word anymore because it's gone beyond that. Well, <clears throat> how could this be 
any other than God that is laying all this out before us. Uh, my point exactly. Okay. Our situation is such that there is an intelligence greater than ours that has seen this over 2,000 years ago and years before that. Yeah, I'm thinking before our creation. I wouldn't disagree. Wasn't that the, uh, wasn't that the issue uh, between Satan and Christ in the first place? <laughs> I think it was also that, that our adversary was upset. He viewed his role as being greater than Christ's. And he wanted to be accepted in with the counsels of God. And when he wasn't, because he wasn't God, he viewed himself as being greater than his creator. Yeah, because he forgot he was a created being. We cannot afford to forget that we are created. Mankind is not getting better day by day. Mankind is quickly denigrating into the worst of mankind. We have today the most light of any generation in this earth's history. Yet today, we see many especially within the church that have chosen to set aside that light. Our conversation yesterday, for some, it was seen as a cold shower. It was direct. How else can we approach this? How else can the word of God be viewed at this time? So let me, uh, as I was listening to that yes. yesterday, um, the image that kept popping into my head, I remember watching a movie at one time, it was an old Western, and there was a guy walking around with a, a billboard on him on both sides. And on the billboard, it's near repent, repent. <laughs> That is the image that I kept seeing when, when we were discussing this yesterday. Mm -hmm. That well, also is the is, that's also what I kept hearing. You know, with we would as we were discussing this, I kept well. You didn't like the word mandate, right? I didn't. <laughs> but, so we'll say commandment. Uh, sure. Does it seem to, again, does it, I'm going to ask this question once more. Did it seem like a commandment to you? Why is it not for me to go forward as Caleb did? Is a commandment. <clears throat> it is a promise. It is the title. Signature for heaven, the document for heaven, our fitness, our character, as we rely upon Christ. Now another comment from the chat, Joshua 17, 12 and 13 reminds me of the necessity of driving out or separating from everything false and ruinous. If God commands, he enables. Now, I'm going to ask this question. By false and ruinous, can we include rumor and innuendo in that definition? Yes, yes why not? Okay. 
Can we include supposition? Of course. Can we include fence sitting? Yes, there's no website. neutrality in God's Okay, we have a sister and a brother both wishing to speak. Please finish, sister, and then please proceed, brother. I said there's no neutrality in God's service, so that does away with fence sitting. Okay, brother? Uh, I'm sorry. I just said that uh, I didn't hear what you were asking. I lost you for a moment. No problem. What, what I was asking is, fence, can fence sitting be included in this portion of the definition? Oh, no. <laughs> Not one bit. Now, we come to a situation as we review the history of what has gone on before us in the other generations. We come to a point where Uriah Smith, with the approval of the president of the General Conference, was teaching that when Mrs. White has an open vision, then that is from God. But when she gives a testimony that that's her opinion. Yesterday, we read from the 23rd testimony that we also find in the omnibus of three testimonies. I didn't take that at all as the opinion of Ellen White. I accepted that as a direct warning from the throne upon high. If we are unwilling to take God at his word, either from the, from, from the Bible or from his prophets, we have a problem. Individually, we are to be compared to Christ. How many of us can say that we compare well to Christ? I'm thinking not very many. I know that I can't. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I mean, I cannot say that, honestly. Agreed. When the children of Israel, the children of Manasseh, were waxen strong, they put the Canaanites to tribute. <clears throat> In 1957, the corporate church cowered before the assembled Protestant churches because they did not wish to be called a cult. Was that putting them to tribute? Again, from the chat, no one is without influence. Those who, in an effort to be neutral, manifest no positive hostility toward Christ and their brethren may think that they are rendering a service to God. But such a thought is delusive. Upon the minds of those who are endeavoring to stand in a neutral position, satanic agencies are working. The first act of selfishness opens the way for the enemy's forces to enter. Our only safety is in active service for Christ Jesus. He declares, you cannot serve God and mammon. All your talents, all your capabilities are mine. I have entrusted you with gifts which are to be put 
to the very best use as consecrated offerings to me. 16 manuscript releases, 10.4. If everything is a gift from God, how can we then fail to return that which he has provided? How can we fail to recognize that everything From the air we breathe, the water we drink, our sight, our breath, our mental capacities are a gift from him. How can we stand saying, time will tell. How can we stand when others are attacking? It makes no sense to me. Are we standing with Christ or are we standing with the adversary? Where are we today? Manasseh shows here. From the outset of the gift of the promised land. That they were choosing not to trust God. They had chosen to trust in their own abilities. They were not wanting to place their trust where it should be. And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people, for as much as the Lord hath blessed me here too? Here they're recognizing the blessing. Here they're saying, we want more. But are they turning to God? Are they doing what God has said to them they needed to do in order to achieve? Are they just taking up space? Are they just sitting on the fence? straddling both sides of the Jordan, and yet not accomplishing what God sent them to do. Now, the verses that we have here, as we look at this, and the children of, Joshua, of Joseph spoke unto Joshua. We come down here. And we find in Genesis 6, or excuse me, Joshua 16, 4. So the children of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim took their inheritance. If we look back here just a little bit, we have verses that God has been addressing and addressing and addressing. So reference here, why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit? But in Genesis 48, verse 22, moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. And as we continue, in the same chapter in Genesis, 
And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. A Dublin. He shall also become a people, and he shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Here is Manasseh being described. Manasseh is being described because God has given to thee one portion above thy brethren. Prophetically, this was promised. Manasseh knew that they were going to inherit this child of Joseph's and his Egyptian wife was going to inherit these portions. And they knew it before they even left Egypt. But they wouldn't prepare themselves for the task that was to come. <clears throat> the church has been given time to prepare. The church has been given a task to prepare, to give a message. But since 1888, the preparation has not been done. I have walked into many Adventist churches. <clears throat> I have talked to other pastors that are afraid to even address prophecy. Because of the way the church is structured, these pastors are allowed to pay for a sermon service to provide to them the outlines of the sermons that they are to give Sabbath by Sabbath. And these are the same sermons that are being given by other Protestant pastors. How difficult is it to do a study like this? It takes time. It takes effort. It takes commitment. When I hear of those that are asking and saying, simplify this message. You've studied it. You can make it easy. You can make it simple. Distill it for me. Don't give me the hard things. Don't tell me the, the things that are going to hit me in the, in the heart and in the head. Just tell me what I need to know. I fear for those people. I fear for those brothers and sisters. Are we not given an example of the man that has gone out to sow seed? And where does the seed fall? We should know this one by heart. On the wayside, on stony places, <clears throat> and on good soil. <clears throat> exactly. We don't know where the good soil is going to be. We don't know where the wayside is going to be. And we don't know where the stony ground is. We are to put the message out and let God do what is necessary it's called broadcast <clears throat> seeding yep was the heart of manasseh as a people 
was it more ground that was prepared to receive a message? Was it the wayside or was it more stony ground? What admonition can we take from this today? How many do we find, especially in the movement, yes, I want to be saved, but where is the effort? Where is the dedication? Where is the commitment? If we're not willing to be dedicated, if we're not willing to commit, if we expect somebody else to do all the work for us, what can we expect to receive? We come down to Numbers 26, 34, and 37. These are the families of Manasseh and those that were numbered of them, 50 and 2,700. But yet in, Mana in Numbers 26, 37, these are the families of the sons of Ephraim, according to those that were numbered of them, 30 and 2,500. So when we look at this, when we consider what's being addressed, we have two numbers. So we have five to 700. And we have 30 to 500. Within the families of Joseph, coming into the promised land, we have 85,200 souls, men, that are now in the promised land. No matter how you cut it, that's a lot of people. Out of two sons, that's a lot of people of the 12 tribes. And Joshua answered them, if thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the Rephaims, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. Is Joshua being sarcastic with these of Manasseh? It sort of seems like it. Why? Because they should know if they are a great people, they should be able to do this. <clears throat> It says, cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites. And it seems as though he was asking uh, or telling them that, or responding, that he got the impression that they were saying that you need to give me this. Yeah, exactly. What's another way of what Joshua is saying to them? Perhaps he wanted to remind them that the that the blessing of, of, of Jacob on the sons of, of Joseph was was so encouraging. They should have kept that in mind, and that should have driven them to get what they could they could you know if, okay. if they if they could succeed just by God's word, just by His promises. Yeah, I, you know the the aspect of it. I'm I'm really I don't think so. I mean, he was just bringing it to their attention. Because uh, I don't see sarcasm as being one of his character traits, because that's not one of Christ's character traits. Well, let's let's put it this way. Joshua is giving them a challenge. 
If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country. Here's an if-then statement, an old programming tool. If you're willing, if thou be a great people, and did we not see the adversary come before Christ with, if thou be the son of God, Isn't Joshua saying to them, if thou be a great people, prove it? Well, yeah, that's, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like? Yeah, I mean, well, reads like. Um, okay. But then again, you know, I, I'm, I'm 2,000 years or so beyond that and really corrupted, you know, so... Well, I mean, the, the problem and the point that I look at here is an area has been promised to Manasseh. An area has been prophetically presented to them from before they even were considering leaving Egypt. And what tribe did Joshua belong to? Was he not an Ephraimite? Yes. So this is one brother saying to his brothers, if thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants. It's come on, brother. You can do this. Yeah, if Ephraim's too small, go there and expand it. No, if Manasseh is too small, go and expand it. So Mount Ephraim. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. No problem. So Genesis 14 and 15. And the 14th year came, cared a lamer. And the kings that were with him and smote the Rephians in Ashtaroth, Canaan, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Imims in Shaveth, Kirathaim. And they, the translator said, and compare this with, and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephians. We're being told, go forward. God is with you. Their brother is saying, God is with you. If you be a great people, stand up. If you be a great people, do what you are supposed to do. Don't wait for somebody else to do it for you. Wasn't Joshua right with Caleb as they inspected the promised land? Did he not come back and give a, pro, a, a very positive report before all of Israel? And wasn't it Joshua and Caleb with Eleazar being the only ones to cross the Jordan? All that's true. And the children of Joseph said, the hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are of Beth Shean and her towns and who are of the valley of Jezreel. Gee, they have chariots of iron. 
what do we have? Oh, we, we have an, an almighty unseen God that has brought us out of Egypt. We have defeated other people. We have crossed the Jordan. He brought Jericho down. We lost at AI because of Achan. And then we took AI and we have been doing this battle. And every time we rely upon God, we win. But now these people have iron chariots. Are they not showing their lack of faith? We want, but we don't want to put forth the effort. We're scared of the effort. Well, they're, they're looking with the eye of humanity instead of the eye of prophecy. There, would you say then that they're not looking with the eye of faith? Correct. They're not using the eye of faith. Yes. Okay. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only. But the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine, for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. Now, is Joshua being facetious? Or is he being prophetic? Is he not telling them that if they have faith, that God is going to lead them, they can drive out the Canaanites, they can take the land, and they can possess it without fear? Amen. Oh, When I'm looking at this, as I look at, at these verses that have been given as reference, they have chariots of iron. But here, Judges 119 and 43. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. So here's Judah infected with the same lack of faith as was Manasseh. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. This was not necessary. But by a lack of faith, Israel was oppressed. Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Who is speaking here? Was it not Moses? Yeah, I think so. That's Deuteronomy. Where was Moses receiving his inspiration from? Was this not the word of God through Moses? 
Was yeah. this was this Moses' opinion? No, this was an opinion that he formed after he was given the word. These are the words that he was told to present, I believe. Yeah. So was this not Moses' testimony from God? Well, yeah. This is why I have such a difficult time with the 1888 time period. It's why one of the main reasons why I have such a difficult time with Uriah Smith. Because Moses was receiving the word of God from on high. And he is telling all of the children of Israel, not just selected tribes, not just a few people, he's telling everyone. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. If we were to say this today, we are not to be afraid of a people with multiple Bible translations. We are not to be afraid of those that rely upon the commentaries. We are not to be afraid of those that have their master of God, their master of divinity. They are more than us. They are greater than us. Yet, God stands by his word. When we rely upon his word, as did Father Miller, as did the pioneers of the faith, and we apply line by line with our simple concordance, are we not shown that God is in charge and he will gain the victory? Yes. Now, God has given the promise. We can either take him at his word or we can deny his word. This is part of our effort. What are we going to hold on to? Do we want to hold on to the word of God or are we going to hold on to the word of man? There is eternity at stake. We need to ask ourselves daily, where is our faith? In what are we trusting? Are we going to continue to exist side by side with the modern Canaanites? Are we going to march under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel? Or do we march under the black banner of the great apostate? That is part of the choice that is presented before us today. If we choose not to look to understand, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, how will we ever be able to worship him that is our creator and the creator of this entire planet?
Any comments? Any thoughts? Okay. It seems like we must be willing. We know that we must be willing to go where he leads, even though we can't see the result. And even though we may be afraid of the result, and it may result in our death for his glory, um, we need to go where he leads and where he tells us to go. Exactly. If we're not willing to go where he leads, then under whose banner are we standing? My question is, is if God is no respecter of persons, then why would we in that respect? Hmm? Okay. And my point is, is the point that Paul was trying to bring up um, that he gives to those uh, everybody the same. I mean, so he is not a respecter of the persons. He's a respecter of the creation, per se. Right. Um, because we know we are created beings that were created against uh, without our being involved with the um, whether or not we wanted to be created. Right. Uh, and that whole story, right, is, is, look, I'm giving you the opportunity to live forever, uh, and this is what you need to do. But if you don't, this is what you're going to get. Um, and so he can't respect people, per se, because of their decisions or anything. Um, as individuals, he can just respect the fact that they're trying to uh, um, adopt the character of Christ instead of the other guy. Yep. What else have we seen as we've gone through this chapter, or these two chapters in the book of Joshua? The more I look at it, the more I am seeing the messages of Revelation 14 being played out. We are shown that we need to fear God. We need to understand that he is our creator and that he has our best interest in heart. He was able to bring this people out of Egypt and to the crossing of the Jordan. We are to give glory to him. We are to show by our actions, by our efforts, that he is in charge. And that we are willing to do that which he tells us to do. This is why July 18th was so very important. Future for America. Joined together to give a warning. That had been published 115 years earlier. But had not been directly offered to the world. Now, there were others at the time that were beginning to discuss this, this warning to Nashville, but they did so by wanting to keep it 
as they would say in the current parlance, on the down low. They want to keep it private. They want to address this so that some within the church begin to understand that, yeah, that's actually true. That was actually said. It's one of those things that the church was embarrassed by. God led so that this message would go out. God led because the message should have gone out 115 years before that. Man wanted to point fingers. They wanted to jeer. They wanted to claim that those that were giving the message were foolish. It's just another Noah. Here's that crazy old guy, Noah. He is out there. There's going to be something that he's calling rain. We've never seen rain. We've never seen what he's, what he's proclaiming is going to happen. It's not going to be. It hasn't happened before. It's not going to happen now. Here we have a church embarrassed by the words of the prophet. And when someone takes up the banner and holds it aloft and is willing to take those slings and arrows, they put him down as deluded. Yeah, they pummel them. <laughs> hard, they pummel them hard all the way through. Yeah, and then they stick them in a trebuchet and launch it. Now, this is no different to me than those that want a simplified message, that want it distilled. Well, you have the experience. You have the understanding. You have the knowledge. So give me that knowledge so that I don't have to put forth the effort. We cannot afford to be like Manasseh. We need to be like Caleb. That is the thought, and that is the consideration with which I present before you today. Giving a message is never going to be easy, especially a message that makes people make a choice. Because it's not going to be an easy choice. Tomorrow, we're going to be looking at Joshua 18. Who has the responsibility for Joshua 18? I think it was uh, Jeff. Okay. We're going to find out tomorrow if he's going to be here. If not, we're going to have a very interesting conversation. Any way we look at it, all, all of these are going to be interesting. Now, who has Joshua 19? Uh, uh, I, I have Angela. Joshua. 19. Yeah, I, I do. Okay. I Angela had uh, 19 and 20, and then I had 21. No, just 19. There's nobody for 20. I took 19. I didn't take 20. Really? I have 20. You have 20. Well, I've got 21. I know that. I've, I've been working on it since that day. Okay. 
brothers and sisters, I'm looking forward to all that you will each bring to this. So 18 is for tomorrow. We will be delving into 18. I pray that Jeff will be with us, but we'll be prepared. Um, yes. You know, uh, it's, I don't know. Uh, is it possible? Because I, I'm, I don't, I don't see, I don't, is Theodore on today? I, you're underneath Theodore's name. Correct. Um, I, I don't see Theodore here today, right? Theodore and Heidi are taking a break. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got uh, Theodore's email, but if you would send me your email. Sir, well, you should have had an email from me yesterday. Was that you that sent that? Yeah. Oh, wait a second. Let me check real quick. I'm sorry. I thought I had... Uh, No, that's, let's see. Oh, yesterday. Okay, let me go back here. And, uh, oh, I see Dwight. Yep. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. I, I just seen Theodore's name pop up with it, but I didn't notice yours. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, ask and he shall receive. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's kind of the point. I mean, we, we had a nice conversation about those spreadsheets and you wanted the whole thing. So you, you have the entire thing on that part of the study. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'm already marking it up. <laughs> That's fine. Well, I do that for my own benefit so I can keep track of stuff. And, but I also have the date that I get that uh, sure. attached to the actual document, the original document, and who actually made the document. So um, I keep all that information. So, you know, because I don't want to I came up with this shit, that stuff. You know, I didn't do this. I understand. Okay. No, I, I do understand. I mean, there are times that Jeff does have internet issues and I'm not, I'm not denigrating him at all. And if I, if I came across in that manner, I apologize to everyone. The point is we will be prepared. Each of these chapters has something amazing for us today. And I look forward to everyone's contribution. So as Theodore and Heidi are taking a break this week, we need to be remembering them in our prayers. They need the time and I agree. So let's go forward. Let us show that we are Caleb's and not Manassas. All right. Roger that. Okay. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the examples that you are showing us and for the opportunity. Uh, to put forth the effort to understand that which you would have presented to us at this time in earth's history. We pray for those that were missing from today's meeting, Father. We ask that you be with them. We ask that your arms be around them. We lift them up. They need you as we need you. We pray for those, Father, that are asking to receive without effort. We know, Father, that there is a harvest to be gained. We know that a harvest cannot be brought in without effort. And that we, whether we are early as workers or late as workers will receive the same compensation because you have promised this. Help us to be willing workers. Help us to be guided 
in your, in your path and by your spirit and help us to be willing to be guided in all of these things. Direct us today, be with us so that your character may be shown to all of those with whom we come in contact. For this, we thank you. And this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.